Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala rasulihi al-amin wa ala alihi at-tayyibin at-tahirin wa sahabatihi ajma'in wa man sara ala nahjihim ila yumiddin amma ba'd. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, this evening what we would like to do is uh, take a quick look at a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is always relevant. And I think uh, one of the reasons that, that, that I would like to discuss it this evening is because when we look at this hadith, especially certain parts of it, then they are more relevant at certain times than at others. You know, when uh, the ummah is going through certain things and so on and so forth, then certain hadith, they stand out a little bit, a little bit more. Although, when we look at this hadith, we will be looking at it in, in relatively general terms, except that we should try to apply it more specifically uh, to what we are facing, what we are facing today. So the hadith is the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu arda, and it is, uh, it is reported by Imam Muslim alayhi rahmatullah. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu wa ardahu says, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَن نَفَّسَ عَن مُؤْمِنٍ كُرْبَةً مِن كُرَبِ الدُّنْيَا نَفَّسَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ كُرْبَةً مِن كُرَبِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَمَن يَسَّرَ عَلَى مُعْسِرٍ يَسَّرَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَمَن سَتَرَ مُسْلِمًا سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَاللَّهُ فِي عَوْنِ الْعَبْدِ مَا دَامَ الْعَبْدُ فِي عَوْنِ أَخِيهِ وَمَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ بِهِ عِلْمًا سَهَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ وَمَا اجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ السَّكِينَةُ وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهُ وَمَنْ بَطَّأَ بِهِ عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ As we said, the hadith is reported by Imam Muslim alayhi rahmatullah and it is from the narration of Abu Hurairah رضي الله عنه وارضا So to begin with, we'll give a quick translation of the, the wording of the hadith and then we'll try to look a little bit further at uh, some of those valuable meanings that are contained within it. So in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ begins by saying that whoever relieves the distress of a believer, the distress meaning the anxieties, the worries, uh, the stress, the hardships of another believer. So whoever relieves a believer's distress from the distresses of this world, right? Because the way that we live in this world it's not stress-free. And we'll talk about that in, in, in just a short while. Whoever relieves a believer's distress from the distresses of this world, then Allah will relieve him from a difficulty or from an anxiety or a difficulty of the difficulties of the hereafter. And then he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever makes easy for an individual who is in difficulty. And here he is specifically speaking of an individual who is in debt and is unable to pay off his or her debt. Then whoever makes it easy for them by either paying off their debt or giving, if, if they happen to be indebted to them, giving them more time or reducing the debt and so on and so forth. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah will make things easy for him in this world as well as the hereafter. Then he says, وسلم, whoever conceals, that is, whoever conceals the faults and the shortcomings of a fellow Muslim in this world, then Allah وعلا, will conceal their, their faults in this world as well as in the hereafter. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that whoever, uh, wallahu fi awnil abd, and Allah will be at the assistance of one of his slaves as long as that individual is at the assistance and at the aid of a fellow Muslim. And whoever treads a path 
seeking therein knowledge, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the path to Jannah or paradise easy for him. And he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that no group of people gather in one of the houses of Allah here. This refers of course to one of the masajid uh, in which they recite the book of Allah and they study it except that uh, mercy will descend upon them and they will be surrounded by tranquility and the angels also, uh, the angels also will surround them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make mention of them in a gathering uh, or in the gathering that is around him, that is with the angels. And then he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that whoever is slowed down by his or her deeds, in other words, if you're held back by your deeds, right, you don't do uh, enough good deeds to earn yourself paradise, then that individual's lineage, in other words, the family you belong to, the people that you're connected to, they will be of no, uh, they will be of no value uh, to you. Now this is actually uh, an amazing and an incredible hadith and so uh, it deserves that we spend a little bit of time uh, a little bit of time on it. First and foremost look at the way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions all of these things. He is relating what we do here to what is going to happen in the Akhirah or the hereafter. And for the mu'min, for the believer there are different incentives to do things. And you know, we are human beings. So when people say, you know, I just do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, sure. You know, a lot of people, you know, when, when they're asked about why they do certain things, they say because it's the right thing. But the reality is that there's always a reason. There's always uh, uh, something driving a person to do things. So doing the right thing, do we... Do it only because it's the right thing? Well, first of all, what, what makes you say that something is right or wrong? See, now when we, when we look at uh, people at large, you're dealing with Muslims and non-Muslims. And for the most part, for the most part, people of faith, and whatever faith they may follow, whether they follow the true faith, that is Al-Islam, or other than that, then it is very often their faith that drives them to do certain things because in their faith they believe in certain rewards they believe that their creator for example has this expectation of them and people who claim that they have no faith for example then they also do these things for a reason not just because it's the right thing like i said again what really determines whether something is right or wrong this is this is one question that uh, that is easy for us to answer because we will merely say I know it's right and I know it's wrong because this is what I find in the Quran this is what I find in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it's not about how I feel right so we don't fight for certain causes and others do they think it's the right thing because whatever justification they may give but you and I we may disagree with certain people in, in, in fighting for a cause they think it's a good cause we think it's a bad cause why do we think it's a bad cause? Because when we look to the Qur'an, when we look to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we realize that this particular issue or this particular matter is something that is not desirable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyways, we said that here the Prophet ﷺ is linking things to the hereafter. Because when you and I do things, we do them with purpose. We do things because we know they are right based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam and we do anticipate compensation and there's nothing wrong with that there's absolutely nothing wrong with that you and I as human beings we, we, we have that nature where we want to know what, what is in it for me what will I get out of this people who don't look at the hereafter they also have some aim it may be that they want to make themselves feel better Right? This is a compensation. People do things to make themselves feel good. Don't think that that is not a compensation. Alhamdulillah, when you do the right thing, that is a natural consequence to begin with. You and I though as Muslims, you see we are pretty focused or we're supposed to be focused because we realize that Allah Jalla wa ala has created us and placed us on the face of this earth and we realize 
And we know from what we see around us that life doesn't go on forever. Life comes to an end. Sooner or later people die. That's just the natural course of things. That's how Allah Jalla has created things. They eventually come to an end. But we also believe that after we die, after we leave this world, there is another life. And that is an eternal life. And so the mu'min, the believer, has this in mind at all times. When I do things, I have to think about the consequences. I have to think about now really doing what's best for my true future. You know, we, we always talk about doing things for our well-being, for our future. Well, the ultimate future, of course, is the akhirah. And so this is why the Prophet ﷺ links so many things to the akhirah or the hereafter. مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَالْيُكْرِمْ جَارَ For example, whoever believes in Allah and the last day, that day of reckoning, the meeting with Allah, uh, you know, rewards and punishments. This is what really what he's saying. So here the Prophet ﷺ is talking about relieving the anxieties, relieving the hardships, Relieving the distress of believers. He links it to the hereafter. So this is where we want to spend just a few moments. And that is, why is he linking it to the hereafter? He says, whoever relieves the distress of a believer, that is in this world, man nafasa an mu'minin kurbatan min kurabid dunya, so one of the hardships in this world, then he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will relieve for that person a distress and anxiety a hardship, a difficulty from the difficulties in the hereafter. Are there difficulties in the hereafter? Well, when we talk about the hereafter, we, maybe our minds will immediately go to Jannah or Jahannam, heaven and hell. But you know, everybody's hereafter begins with their death. There is what we call Al-Qiyamatu Sughra and Al-Qiyamatu Al-Kubra. The minor day if we, if we can call it that, Al-Qiyamatu, uh, Al-Sughra, uh, you know, the, the, the minor hour, if you will, when every individual's hereafter begins is with their death. Well, the hereafter, after what? After here. Where is here? Here is this world. There are different stages that we go through. When a person dies, they're in that state known as uh, Al-Barzakh. Okay, that's between this world and that hereafter, the, fi the, the, the final day. Okay? And then after that, when the entire world comes to an end, then the, the final hour is established. Uh, that is the greater hour, if you will. That is when everybody will be raised and standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam relates things to the hereafter whether it be the minor or the major. Meaning this, you see, when we die, then in the grave, Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have informed us that the grave is either going to be a place in which a person receives blessings from Allah and there is actual enjoyment in the grave, or it is a place of distress, and it is a place of punishment. May Allah Jalla wa ala protect us from that. So we know that uh, certain people, again we know this, it is established in the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, that certain people will be punished in their graves. Again, we ask Allah all the time to protect us from that. There are those who will be punished in their graves for uh, things that you and I may even consider to be uh, negligible and unimportant. So you find in the uh, authentic sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, he speaks of certain people who will, be, uh, who will be punished in their graves because they did not cover themselves properly when they relieved themselves or that they did not cleanse themselves properly after relieving themselves. We hear of people who are going to be punished in their graves because they used to spread uh, falsehood. They used to say things to people to, 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 to have them at odds with one another, what we call a namima. Okay, spreading unfavorable news amongst people to cause uh, differences amongst them. So, 
one has to be cautious and has to remember that the hereafter, yes, there are many difficulties that a person can face. Then let's not forget about that day when all of us will be raised before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the first man to walk the face of this earth, Adam alayhi salam, to the last person that will walk the face of this earth. You know that in the authentic sunnah, we are told about how we will be raised. And we will all be on one plane and everybody will be able to see everybody. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam speaks about how, uh, you know, how it will be such a, uh, a horrific day. And it will be a day of terror. And you all know the ayat of the Qur'an in which Allah jalla wa ala tells us about people and you would look at them and وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارَةً The people would look as though they're intoxicated but they're not really intoxicated. We hear about how uh, people will flee from one another, from the closest of people to them. Mothers will actually flee from their children and children will flee from their, from their parents and so on and so forth. We know of how the sun will come so close to an individual uh, that you know the Prophet ﷺ says the sun will be a mile away and actually a mile away is only one translation. Meel, qadra meel. Meel could either mean that mile that we measure in terms of distance and meal is also a word that is used for the stick that is used to put kuhl in the eyes. The bottom line is the sun will be very near. And so people will be perspiring. And in the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, we, we learn that people will perspire and, and everybody will be standing there according to their deeds. And so the perspiration of some individuals will come to their ankles. For others it will reach their knees. For others it will reach their waist. For others it will reach their chests. And for others it will be right up to their, right up to their mouths as though they are drowning as though they are drowning in their perspiration. May Allah Jalla wa'ala make that day easy for us. It will be a day filled with difficulties. And so, you and I will be in need on that day for the relief, for relief from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is where it becomes relevant. مَن نَفَّسَ عَن مُؤْمِنٍ كُرْبَةً مِنْ كُرَبِ الدُّنْيَا نَفَّسَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ كُرْبَةً مِنْ كُرَبِ الْآخِرَةِ أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام أو مِنْ كُرَبِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ So imagine all of the, uh, the things that will be happening on that day. I mean, people will be in such distress that they will want and, and it will last that day will just go on and on and on. It will be like 50,000 years if you measure it according to the uh, to the time of this world. And so the Prophet ﷺ says that the people will be in such distress that they will want that day to come to an end. They want themselves to pass beyond that station that they are in. And that is just merely standing before Allah Jalla waiting for Him to come and judge between them. And so the people will come to an agreement. And by the way, uh, as we know from the authentic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, people will be raised in their birthday suits, basically naked. But you know what? It won't matter because they will be in such distress that nobody will notice. Nobody will care. And so they come to this agreement that, you know what? We need to get beyond this. Like, how long is this going to go on for? And so they go to Adam alayhi salam and they plead with him that, listen, you are a prophet from the prophets of Allah. You are our father. In other words, he is the, the father of humanity, of humankind. So why don't you intercede on our behalf with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the prophet Adam alayhi salam, at that time, he will excuse himself. And he will say, nafsi, nafsi. Basically, I'm concerned about myself. Just as you are concerned, I too am concerned. And so he will pass them off. And they will go to another prophet, you know, to Ulil Azm min al Rusul, the, the prophets that are known as, as, as the, the, you know, the people of firm resolve. They will go from one prophet to another, and each one of them will say, I'm not your guy. I, I, no, I, I'm worried about myself. Just as you are worried, I am worried. Until they come to the Prophet, and we will be amongst them. Until we come to the Prophet, and plead with him, and he will say, Ana laha, ana laha. I am the one for it. I am the one for it. So imagine these are some of the distresses that people will go through in the Akhirah. And so you and I, we work for the Akhirah. Yes, we live in this world and uh, we have to live in this world. But all the time we are kept 
in check, you know, we balance ourselves because we think about the akhirah. What will happen? I'm going to meet Allah. What will Allah say about what I'm doing now? What am I going to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what I have done here? And then we know about all of these difficulties and, and, and anxieties that people will face on that day. Don't we want to make it easy for ourselves? So the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us different ways through which we can make matters easy for us on that day. When I say we make matters easy for us, that is we earn relief from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. One of those things he mentions is that we assist one another, we help fellow Muslims in relieving their anxieties and their distresses and their hardships in this world. And this brings me to another point. You know, people sometimes write and they mean well. But sometimes we don't really think about what we're saying. You know, they, 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 they're really wonderful wordings and you'll find them on the internet and you know, people post them on Facebook. But sometimes, as I said, maybe people don't think those things through. And so I actually have people, when they speak to me, when they call the helpline, they ask about things like that. You know, they think that there's something wrong with them. Let me give you an example. So somebody calls me and says, is there something wrong with me? Am I really not a believer? Because I read on such and such a site, for example, that Muslims never feel distress. Muslims don't get depressed. Why? Because if you have Allah with you, then you have nothing to worry about in your life. Doesn't that sound wonderful? I mean, if you read it, it sounds beautiful. That if Allah is with you, you will never feel distress. If Allah is with you, you will never, you will never be depressed. Really? Do you believe that? What is reality? The reality is, even the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam felt depressed. Even he sallallahu alaihi wasallam felt distress. Even he sallallahu rabbi wasallam felt sadness. You know, we, we have this whole thing in, in the seerah, we talk about Amul Huzn. The year of sadness. You think the Prophet alayhi was not affected when, pe- when he lost people that, who, who were close to him? Why? Or what is one of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the journey of al-Isra wal miraj It was to console him. Well, why would he need consolation? Because he was feeling, he was feeling sad. So yes, people, Muslims, believers, do feel distress in this world. We shouldn't be fooled into thinking that, you know, if you're a believer, you'll never be sad. No, no, it happens. But in our deen, in Islam, we are taught how to deal with sadness. Distress? How could there not be distress? I mean, you look at what happened to these prophets that Allah mentions in the Qur'an. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa teaches us certain du'as, certain supplications to say, to relieve ourselves of al-ham, wal-gham, wal Distress and anxieties and hardships and difficulties and depression. So the Prophet alayhi salatu taught us those things. And so we should be careful when we speak and not just sort of make these blank statements that, you know, if Allah is with you, then, you know, if you're a true believer, you'll never feel sad. It is not true. True believers also feel sad. True believers also fall into distress. But they are taught how to, uh, how to deal with it. Um, and, and so let's look very quickly then um, at the issue of distress and anxiety. Why does Allah put us through these things? This is a question. And, 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 and yes, I know what I'm saying. Why does Allah put us through them? Because nothing happens unless Allah Jalla wa'ala wills it. So when any of us feels distress, when any of us feels anxiety or depression and sadness and we find ourselves going through hardships, yes, this is from Allah. From Allah meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is causing it to happen. And of course, people ask, why? Why would Allah put somebody through these things? Looking very quickly at the Qur'an, and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
we can say that, you know, the reasons that people go through these things, we can boil them down to three basic reasons. All right? So let's begin with those uh, three basic reasons. The first of those reasons is this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes an individual to go through certain types of distress and certain difficulties because he wants good for them in the sense that he wants to wipe away their sins. He wants to wipe away their sins. Listen, you and I are human beings. And we, by nature, are going to do things which are, which are wrong. It's human nature. We are not angels. We are prone to err. Kullu bani Adam khatta. All right, all of the children of Adam are prone to err. This is from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, when we commit sins, when we make these uh, these errors, if you will, then what happens? Well, we are deserving of punishment, and that punishment can come at different times. One can be punished in this world, or one can be punished in their grave, or one can be punished in the hereafter, after the resurrection. And the reality is that the sooner a person receives their punishment, the easier it is. In other words, the punishment of the grave is more severe than any punishment a person can receive in this world. And the punishment after resurrection is greater than the punishment even in, in the grave. And so there are amongst us those who may do things which anger Allah Jalla wa'ala. And as a result of it, we are deserving of punishment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to spare that person from the punishment in the grave. For example, Allah wants to spare that individual punishment in the grave. So then as a result of it, He puts that person through certain hardships in this uh, in this world. And so if we look to uh, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the musnad of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, what do we find? We find the following hadith. In Allah azza wa jal, lamma nazzala ala rasulihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama qawlahu laysa bi amaniyikum wala amani ahli al-kitab man ya'mal su'an yujza bih وَلَا يَجِدْ لَهُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيًّا وَلَا نَصِيرًا This is in Surah An-Nisa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here that paradise is not obtained by your wish. You know, you, you wish for paradise. You want paradise. Nor that of the people of the book. But rather, he says, whoever does a wrong will be recompensed. مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجَزَ بِهِ Imagine, this is Allah Jalla wa'ala now speaking, man ya'mal su'an yujza bih. So whoever does wrong, then they will be recompensed for it. In other words, you have to face the consequences of that. And will not find besides Allah a protector or, or a helper. Now the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they took these words seriously. So here was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu arda. When these, when these words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were sent down, he couldn't take it. You know, to the extent that you could practically hear the distress from his body. Alright, so, so, so it was like he was moaning and groaning because of these words. He says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, كَيْفَ الْعَمَلُ بَعْدَ هَذِهِ الْآيَةِ مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ وَمَنْ مِنَّا لَمْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا Can you imagine? And, and this is the problem with many of us. We read the Qur'an, but we sort of glance over the words without paying attention. Look at Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu arda, paying attention, knowing that these are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whoever does a wrong, مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ That's it. You have to face the consequences. So he says to the Prophet ﷺ, what do we do after this? Who amongst us doesn't commit any sins? Who doesn't do any wrong? And so the Prophet ﷺ consoles him. He says, Ghafar Allahu laka ya Aba Bakr. May Allah forgive you. 
O Abu Bakr. Alasta tagtam? Do you not feel distress? Alasta tamrab? Do you not get ill? Do you not become sick? Alasta أو علي ألست تصاب تصاب بال بالأمراض قال بلى يا رسول الله. So the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام is reminding him. He says, hang on a second. Yes, Allah جل وعلا is saying that you have to face the consequences. He immediately is thinking about punishment in the grave. He is thinking about punishment in the hereafter. This is Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه وارضاه. But the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام is consoling him. He's saying that, listen, don't you become ill? Don't you feel that you go through times of, of anxiety and distress and so on and so forth? Don't calamities befall you? And he responds in the affirmative that, yes, indeed, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so the response from the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was, فَذَلِكَ مِمَّا تُجْزَوْنَ بِهِ مِنْ خَطَايَاكُمْ So, these difficulties... The distress that a person goes through in this world, this is actually, you, you don't have to look at it in a negative light. But rather it is takfirun lisayyat. It is a means of expiation, of having those wrongs washed away. This is what the Prophet wasallam tells us. And then of course, uh, we, we look to the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and he tells us, مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ يُصِيبُهُ هَمٌ أَوْ حَزَنٌ أَوْ 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 He's talking about a believer and that the believer will go through times of distress. The, the believer will go, th- will go through times of difficulty and hazan, even sadness. Yes, depression. Muslims can be afflicted by these things. But then he's telling us, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, that if a person is patient, if a person, person tolerates those things, in other words, we don't complain about Allah to people, but we complain to Allah about our difficulties. We turn to Him. So we bear these difficulties with patience, and as, as a result of it, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِلَّا كَفَّرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ مِنْ خَطَايَاهُ حَتَّى شَوْكَةَ يُشَاكُهَا So as a result of these difficulties and this depression and distress that a person goes through, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expiate will expiate sins. And he says, to the extent that if a person were to be pricked with a thorn, even that, even that would be a means of expiation, insha'Allah, insha'Allah ta'ala. So then, we said, why is it that we go through times of difficulties and distress and so on? One of those reasons is exactly what we mentioned here, and that is so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipes away our uh, our bad deeds. Okay, so you can accept them as a sort of a, a recompense for the wrongs that we have committed here. And so we should actually be thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that through these difficulties that He puts us through in this world, He is protecting us from being punished in the grave and, uh, and beyond. A second reason that people go through hardships and distress and anxiety is because they turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is, it is the result of their negligence towards their duties that they have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the proof of that is in the Quran. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ لِمَا حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا Alright, so Allah Jalla wa Ala is telling us in the Qur'an very clearly that whoever turns away فَمَنْ وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي Whoever turns away from my reminder. In other words, people who pay no attention to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, that is the teachings of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, they do not practice this deen, al-Islam. فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ then indeed such a person will have a miserable and a wretched life. Mm. Question. But look, we see these non-Muslims and they're living it up and they're... We hear this a lot. How, who says that they're living miserable lives? Look at they're, they're enjoying life. With even Muslims who are disobedient. Some of them are so rich. 
driving Lamborghinis, living in subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us something which is inaccurate. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ And remember that here Allah Jalla wa ala is emphasizing and saying that absolutely and for certain they will have depressed lives and miserable lives. Well the answer to the question is yes, you may look at people and they seem to be enjoying themselves. They appear to be living it up. But do you and I know what internal struggles that they are, they, they are fighting? And do you think that people are going to tell you? You think that a millionaire who is you know, going through hell, really, they can't sleep properly, they can't, you know, they, they, they're not content with their lives. Do you think that they're going to tell you? Those who are uh, you know, openly disobedient, do you think they're going to admit to you that they're, 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 they're living hell inside of them? They're not going to admit it. They are not going to, just like you and I, although you know, we may be uh, trying our best to adhere to the teachings of Islam, but we go through certain difficulties, but we don't share them with everybody. Maybe we did something in our lives that we're not proud of, but we don't share them with everybody. We keep certain things to ourselves for whatever reasons. So rest assured that although a person who is far from Allah Jalla wa ala may appear to be very happy and appear to be content, except that in reality they are living in misery. And you know, some of the proofs of that are clear to us. Look at how many of such people end up, you know, on drugs. How many of them, people think that they're living it up and, and you couldn't have a better life. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, the person overdoses or jumps off a cliff or commits suicide. It's happened to so many of them and you and I, you and I are aware of that. In any event, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, for certain, these people will have a miserable life. وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أعمى. And Allah Jalla wa Ala says they will be raised on the Day of Judgment blind. And they will say, O oh my Lord, why have you raised me blind when I was seeing before, when I, when I was able to see? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them, قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا Similarly, okay, in the life of the world, my ayat, my signs, my verses huh, came to you and you ignored them. So similarly today you shall be, you shall be ignored. Alright, so this is the second of the reasons. The people who turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are going to go through these, uh, through these difficulties in their lives and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really sending them signs. Allah Jalla wa Ala sometimes puts a person through very difficult times to make them realize that they need Allah Jalla wa Ala and they return to Him. And many of us have heard stories of individuals who came to Islam, who came to Islam, leave alone people who are Muslims and then they you know, neglected Allah and they went through some hardships and so they, you know, they, they changed their lives around. But people who were non-Muslims and they may have been involved in a major accident and so on and so forth and afterwards this got them thinking why they were lying in their hospital beds for example it got them thinking and they started researching and then they realized that no there's a you know there, there, there's a there's something greater to live for there's something greater to live for and then they discovered they discovered al-islam so this is the second reason as for the third reason then it is in order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate the status of people. Example, Allah jalla wa ala may love you, but, and, and, and so, you know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves someone, He wants to place them in the highest place in Jannah. But, your salah, your siyam, your zakah, they're not quite enough to get you to that highest level. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put those whom He loves in that situation, He will put them through certain difficulties so He will elevate their status. Okay? And this again, we find, uh, you know, if you look through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will find, you will find this. Right? That, okay, the person is not negligent towards Allah jalla wa ala, the person isn't a major sinner, but you know, their deeds are not so many that they can attain that high status. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is why we learn 
uh, in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that when Allah loves a person and Allah wishes good for a person, He puts them through hardships. Asaba min Allahu jalla wa'ala will cause calamities uh, to befall uh, to befall these people. So then we said that there are three basic reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows people or causes people to go through certain uh, hardships and, and anxieties and distresses. And we said of them is the, the last one that we mentioned was what? To elevate their status. Another we mentioned is because they turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is putting them through these difficulties so that they may, they may turn back to him, tabaraka wa ta'ala. And the first of those reasons that we mentioned was to expiate, to wash away, uh, to wash away their sins so that they receive you know, their, their recompense for whatever wrong they have done in this world and they are spared of punishment uh, in the hereafter. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we said, connects what we do in this world to the hereafter. مَن نَفَّسَ عَن مُؤْمِنٍ كُرْبَةً مِن كُرَبِ الدُّنْيَا So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as we said uh, earlier, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also used to have anxiety at times. And, 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 and this is why, uh, you know, I want to make this very real for everybody. Not just to rely on those wonderful and warm words that although they sound nice, but they are not necessarily accurate. Yes, a person may be a believer and yet they go through hardships. The Sahaba uh, talk about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they say, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُ كُرْبَةٌ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُ kurba. So did he feel distress? Did he feel anxiety? Yes, there were times when he felt anxiety and distress. صَلَوَاتُ رَبِّي وَسَلَامُهُ عَلَيْهِ And how did they know it? Because he never complained. He never said, oh, why did Allah do this to me? And how? No. But they would notice it. They said, أَكْثَرَ مِنْ مَسِّ لِحْيَتِهِ Ya subhanallah. People have habits, right? One of the things that he used to do is, he used to, he used to grab his beard, he used to wipe over his beard a lot when he felt distress and anxiety. وَأَكْثَرَ مِنَ الْمُطَاعَةِ مِنَ الْمُطَالَعَةِ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَأَكْثَرَ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ وَأَكْثَرَ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ So three things they noticed when he was feeling distressed, when he, you know, when, when he was anxious, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they, they noticed it because he had that habit of rubbing his beard. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would look up to the heavens and he would also repeat al-istighfar even more. That is, he would say astaghfirullah even more when he was, uh, when he was in that sort of, uh, when he was in that sort of situa- uh, situation. We said distress, anxiety, hardships, depression, it's not only for the non-Muslims, and it's not only for the, the ones who are disobedient to Allah Jalla wa'ala. Even the best of creation, starting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then if you look at the Prophets, even they went through those things. Look at the Prophet Yunus Ibn Matta Alayhi salam. We know his story, and how he was in, you know, three levels of darkness, if you will. There was the darkness of the night, it was the darkness of, of, of the ocean and the darkness of the belly of, of the whale. And when uh, Yunus alayhi salam felt distress, when he felt distress, what did he do? He turned uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَنَادَ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ أَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكْ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ So we learn of how he alayhi salam that is, Yunus alayhi salam, when he was in those depths of darkness, he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَنَادَ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ So in those depths of darkness, he turned to Allah jalla wa ala, أَلَّا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتْ Acknowledging that he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one and only uh, deity, uh, there is no de- deity other than you, subhanak, exalted are you, indeed I have been of, of the wrongdoers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to him, uh, and he relieved him of that distress that he was in. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ So الْغَمْ Again, distress, yes, even believers face distress. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And here I think وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Never forget this dua. Never forget this because as a result of it, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved whom? Saved his prophet. And after telling us that he saved his prophet, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ So we learn of what the call of Yunus alayhi salam was. And then Allah tells us, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ And so we responded to him, وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ And we saved him from the distress. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And similarly, we will save, we will save the believers. Meaning what? Meaning use this dua, follow in the footsteps of Yunus alayhi salam, and as Allah saved Yunus alayhi salam, He will save you as well. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Then if you look to the uh, sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, دَعْوَةُ أَخِي ذِنُّون Okay, so he's talking about the dua of the Prophet Yunus alayhi salam, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ مَا دَعَى بِهَا مَكْرُوبٌ إِلَّا كَشَفَ اللَّهُ بِهَا كُرْبَتُهُ Okay, or kurbata. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam says, nobody uses the dua of his brother Yunus alayhi salam except that Allah will relieve them of the distress that they are uh, that they are experiencing. Here's another dua as well. And, and, and I mean, I, I understand that uh, we're going through the hadith, but we're talking about depression and distress and anxiety. Yes, even the believer feels these things, unlike what some people are trying to tell us. But we are taught by the Prophet alayhi salatu salam how to deal with these things. And of the ways that we deal with those things is a dua. One of those duas was, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al Another dua. Huh? And this is uh, an important one that you will find in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, found in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Dua'ul karbi an yaqul The dua for distress. That is, to be relieved of distress and depression and anxiety is the following. لا إله إلا الله العظيم الحليم لا إله إلا الله رب العرش العظيم لا إله إلا الله رب السماوات ورب العرش الكريم If we spend five minutes to learn that dua, it's too much, isn't it? You can learn it in less than five minutes. But learn that dua and believe that it is, it is a means of relief from whatever distress that you are feeling and whatever anxieties that you have. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that this is the dua that you should, uh, that you should, that you should re- uh, recite. In other words, everything for us goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, since we're on the topic of distress and how to relieve ourselves of distress, well, I mentioned to you now how the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, when he was feeling distress, the Sahaba, from the things that they noticed, is that he would repeat istighfar. He would repeat istighfar. That is, to say astaghfirullah, which means, O oh Allah, forgive me. O oh Allah, pardon me uh, my, my sins. So let's look very quickly. What are some of the things that, that al-istighfar benefits us in? Okay, so in one of the ahadith, we learn that, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man akthara min, min al-istighfari. جعل الله له من كل هم فرجا ومن كل ضيق مخرجا ورزقه من حيث لا يحتسب. So whoever engages in a lot of istighfar, who says astaghfirullah often, then Allah will appoint a way out for them from every distress and the relief from every uh, from every anxiety or every difficulty, and Allah will provide for them through means that they never through means that they never imagined. And here, I just want to come back and remind myself and everybody that very often we say things. So we said, oh, you know, we heard, for example, we heard in a lecture, we read in a hadith that if you say this or if you say that, and then we say those things and nothing happens. Right? What is the reason? Well, the promise of Allah is there. This is the cure. But it is because sometimes we are not conscious and aware of what we are saying it. So we repeat things in parrot fashion without it coming from the heart. 
without, without any real belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is listening to us. So whenever we say any of these adhkar, then let us remember whom we are addressing. Let us remember whom it is that we are dealing with. Let us remember that this is our portion. This is what we are required to do. And the results are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we do our part right, and Allah jalla wa ala will fulfill His promise to us, and He will relieve us of those distresses and of those, uh, of those anxieties and so forth. So when it comes to al-istighfar, this is one of the things that we learn in the, uh, in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, today I posted something, uh, because as I was uh, looking at the ayat on istighfar and so on and so forth, I came across something and I said, subhanallah, um, we should be reminding one another of these things. If you look to the Qur'an, you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the following in Surah Al-Anfal. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ So Allah jalla wa ala is addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, telling him that as long as he is amongst the people, physically he is amongst them, then Allah jalla wa ala will not bring about a punishment to destroy them. But that's not where he stops. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ And Allah will not bring destruction upon them as long as they continue to seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is reported from some of the salaf and it is reported that Jafir, uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq said these words. He said, لَوْ نَزَلَتْ سَاعِقَةٌ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ لَأَصَابَتْ كُلَّ النَّاسِ إِلَّا الْمُسْتَغْفِرِ he said, if a thunderbolt was to come down from the sky, it could reach everyone. But it will not reach the person who is doing istighfar. I mean, whether or not that report is authentic, Allahu A'lam. But the ayah is an ayah of the Qur'an. And this is a, a legitimate interpretation of it. So yes, Al-istighfar is also a protection from natural disasters and calamities as we see, uh, as we see from the Qur'an. And uh, when we look at al-istighfar, uh, of course, the, uh, you know, there's so much that can be said. Si'at uh, al-rizq, how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors of, of sustenance and so on and so forth. You look to, to the Qur'an in Surah Nuh, you will find it. Okay, and with Hud alayhi salam, we see that he also uh, he also advised his people. وَأَنِسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ ثُمَّ تُوبُوا إِلَيْهِ يُمَتِّعْكُمْ مَتَاعًا حَسَنًا إِلَى أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى وَيُؤْتِي كُلَّ ذِي فَضْلٍ فَضْلًا. Anyway, the ayat are many, and I think we've discussed uh, al istighfar before, so I'm going to skip over uh, some of these ayat because uh, we have we have discussed them previously. But we find, again, when we look to uh, you know, incidents that happened with the Sahaba or with some of the Tabi'een, when they were experiencing drought, one of them remembered, hang on a second, uh, you know what? Allah is there for us. And so he would engage in istighfar and the people would ask him, like, what, what are you doing? And the next thing you knew, that the rain was falling on his garden and his garden and his garden alone because the hearts are attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So al-istighfar is one of those means through which we can alleviate uh, any kind of distress, uh, any kind of distress that we are that we are feeling. And of course, it is a vikr. It is uh, a form of remembering Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And Allah Jalla wa Ala uh, tells us, "Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma innu tatma innu al qurub." We'll take another uh, two or three minutes, and then Inshallah Taala we'll pray maghrib and we'll, uh, we'll complete our topic. Um, when we talk man nafasa an mu'minin kurbatan min kurabi min kurabi dunya so what are some of the things that we can do to relieve one another or to assist one another in, in ridding ourselves of distress man nafasa an mu'minin kurbatan min kurabi ad dunya so what can you and i do for others this is this is what we want to know because now we are told that if we do so then on the day of qiyamah allah will remove difficulties for us there are many ways, okay? Obvious ways, I'm not even going to go to any details because they are so obvious to us. 
So for example, what our brothers and sisters are facing, whether it be in Syria, whether it be in Myanmar, whether it be uh, in Somalia or Iraq or wherever else it may be, we know that dua of course is there. This goes without saying, absolutely, at all times. A dua, a dua, a dua. But then what? Then of course one of the obvious means, and alhamdulillah this ummah is not a stingy ummah, it is a giving ummah. And so we know that those who are able, inshallah ta'ala, they will give. Find any reliable organization that is sending you know, relief to our brothers and sisters, wherever it may be, and inshallah ta'ala, you will have done your share. And I believe I mentioned before, a person may think, but you know, all I can afford is a buck. I mean, what's a dollar going to do? Well, if a million of us give a dollar each, that's a million dollars. Right? So don't think about how little you and I have. First of all, let it come from the heart. Secondly, don't think about how much or how little it is because it all adds up at the end of the day. What's important is that we do our share. Anyway, this is one way. But, you know, it's not only, we, we, we don't only relieve the hardships of others with money. That is not the only thing. There are many other things. And, you know, I'm talking now about real life. Every day we have around us people going through difficulties. Whether it be their marital issues, issues with their children, uh, accidents, whatever it may be. When people are distressed, you find, subhanAllah, and, and everybody's different. Some people, over the smallest of things, they lose it. So you and I, you and I, when we see a, 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 a believer in distress, we need, besides or alongside dua, we need to console them. We need to comfort them. We need to advise them. One of the things that we should constantly be advising one another of is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We teach them how to deal with this distress. We teach them that, you know, this is from Allah jalla wa ala. And so say, indeed, we belong to Allah and to Him is, is our return. And then we tell them of what the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. That if you are that person who relates everything back to Allah Jalla wa Ala, ulaika alayhim salawatun min rabbihim wa rahmat, then you're going to attain mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The blessings of Allah Jalla wa Ala will come upon you and you will be considered to be amongst, uh, amongst, the, rightly, uh, amongst the rightly guided. Okay. In terms of relieving the distress, of a fellow Muslim, doing something for another Muslim to, 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 to lighten the burden for them. Do you know that that is from the greatest acts of ibadah? Al Hasan al Basri alayhi rahmatullah. And you know, I want that, uh, you know, that, that we really pay attention to these words. Because some of us, unfortunately, when it comes to ibadah, we have a very, very narrow minded approach to it. So Al Hasan al Basri alayhi rahmatullah. It's just absolutely amazing what he says. He says, one of you says, أَحُجُّ أَعْتَمِرُ أُصَلِّ أَصُومْ أُزَكِّ One of you says that I will perform hajj, I'm going to do umrah, I will offer salah, I'm going to fast, I'm going to give zakah, I'm going to pay charity. Then he asks this question. He says, هَلْ هَذِهِ هِيَ الْعِبَادَةُ فَحَسْبِ Do you think that Ibadah or worship is restricted only to this? He said, La. Farrij an makrub. Do something to relieve the distress of the distressed one. Sil munqati'an. Sil rahiman. Fahadihi hi al ibadah. He says, Because ibadah is more than just that. Ibadah is also about consoling a person who is in difficulty. Ibadah is also, you know, uh, Reaching out to people who are alone and cut off from others. Ibadah is also going uh, and, and, and maintaining family ties. And then we learn of an incident that happened with uh, Al-Hasan Al-Basri alayhi rahmatullah and uh, another one of the, uh, the, the, the tabi'een. And perhaps I will, I will remember his name in, uh, in a short while. So anyways, an individual came once to Al-Hasan Al-Basri alayhi rahmatullah and he says that I want so and so, uh, Thabit al Bunani. Thabit al Bunani. He says, I want, I want you to send somebody with me to so and so because I want a loan from him. But if I go and ask, he won't give it to me. But if you send Thabit with me, because you know Thabit is known by that person, that person will listen to Thabit. 
Right? If he intercedes on my behalf, then the man will give me the loan. So Al Hassan Al Basri alayhi rahmatullah says to a group of them, he says, Go to him, go to Thabit in the masjid and tell him to go with this man. So they went to Thabit in the masjid and they found that he was praying. Afterwards they said to him, Al Hassan says that you should go with this man and intercede for him. Okay? And what does he say? He says, No. I am praying, leave me in the masjid to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they came back to Al-Hasan and they said, this is what he said. Al-Hasan says to him, it says to them, اِذْهَبُوا إِلَيْهِ وَقُولُوا لَهُ يَا أُعَيْمِشْ This is um, hard to explain in English. تَصْغِيرْ أَعْمَشْ Al-A'mash, اللي ما, ما يعني Anyways, it, it, I, I can't, I, I really can't explain it in English. Anyway, he he addresses him not in necessarily the best of terms, let's say. Almost in a degrading way. Okay? Ya u'aymish. Avananta anna salataka hiya al-ibadatu kulluha. Do you think that your salah is, that's, that's, all, that, that's all there is to ibadah? Wallahi, la dhahabuka ma'a akhika al-muslimi li qadai hajatihi khayrun min alfi raka'ah. He says, for you to go with your fellow Muslim and to help him take care of his needs is more valuable than 1,000 raka'ah. And so you and I really have to think. This is ibadah. When you reach out to fellow Muslims, when you assist a fellow Muslim in any difficulty that they may be, and it doesn't necessarily have to be financial in any way at all. Our point is, help one another, help fellow Muslims, because... This is an act of ibadah and it is through this that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also relieve some of our distresses from the distresses of the akhirah. So let's pray Salat, uh, salat al-Maghrib and then inshallah we'll try to finish up within another 15 uh, minutes or so. Wallahu a'ala.
طيب بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وما وراءه بعد. We'll try to finish up as 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 quickly as we can. But you know it's it's such an important topic that we need to remind ourselves that we cannot live for ourselves. We as Muslims need to live in such a way that we are always serving other Muslims, that we are serving humanity, that we are doing things for other people. 
When talking about this hadith, uh, the Imam Ibn Rajab al hambali alayhi rahmatullah in his book uh, Jami' al ulum wal Hikam, he mentions uh, he mentions a, a, a very important story that, that we can take lessons from. And again, remember what I just said. We cannot be selfish. We need to live in such a way that we are there for others. We need to lend a helping hand. However we can manage, whether it's something small or something big that we do. Listen to this uh, incident which uh, Ibn Rajab Alayhi rahmatullah mentions in his book, Jami' al Ulum uh, wal Hikam. He speaks of a group of people that were traveling, and one of them said, Listen, I want to be the Amir, I want to be the Amir. And normally, when somebody says, I want to be the leader of the group, he's up to no good. Normally, come on, I mean, nobody just says, Hey, let me be the leader. And of course, it puts people in doubt. But this individual, subhanAllah, was different from others. Listen to what happened. They say that when they went out on a journey, Okay, he said to them, you have to listen to the Amir, you have to listen to the leader of the group. So he said to them, uh, Okay, they came to, you know, they, 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 they were traveling, they came to a spot and he said, hey, nobody move, everybody sit wherever you are. And after he said that to them, he himself would get up, and he would prepare food for them and he would go and collect the firewood because of course they didn't have propane stoves in those days so he would collect the firewood and he would ignite the fire and they would all want to do something he said but remember you chose me as the emir and as the emir I say nobody moves everybody sit where you are and he would prepare the food for them and when they would go to bed at night he would stand in salah and he would be the guard he would be watching over everyone they said to the extent that if you know, if it was cold and we had blankets over us and the blanket slipped, he would come and he would cover us up again with that blanket. See what I'm talking about? This is the attitude that we have to have. We have to be there for others. They said when he died and he was taken to the maqsala, the, the, the place where they were going to, uh, where they, go, they, they were going to bury him, they found written on him. They found written on him the words, Bara'atul lahu min al That this person is free from the hellfire. And the one who was washing the body says that it's not as though somebody wrote it on his skin. It was like a tattoo between his skin and his, and his flesh. And of course, I mean, when we look to uh, many of the incidents that happened in, in, in previous times, yeah, there are some karamat, there are some things which are out of the ordinary that actually, uh, that actually do take place. Whatever it is though, we know from the Qur'an and we know from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that when you and I do things for each other, in other words, we do them sincerely, then even if that thing appears to be negligible in the sight of others, except that it could be the means of us entering paradise. In the Sahih, in an authentic hadith, what about that man from Bani Israel who saw a, you know, a branch that was, that was in, the, in the pathway of the people? What did he say? He says, come on, you know what? I'm going to remove that branch and toss it aside so people are not, uh, people are not um, in any difficulty, in, in, don't face any difficulties in, in passing by. Right? They don't want, you know, he didn't want that somebody trip over the branch or something of that nature. And what do we learn? We learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciated what this man did so much that as a result of it, he entered him into, into a jannah. And we know the same thing about, uh, about that individual. And in some narrations it is that a man, in another narration it is that it, it was a prostitute, a woman from Bani Israel, who did what? Who gave dog water to drink. And Allah Jalla wa'ala appreciated that so much that he entered him into, into paradise. Or he entered her into, into paradise. So life is not just about me. Life is about us. Life is about us worrying about one another. And yes, although we do put emphasis on helping our fellow Muslims, let's not forget that if Allah Jalla wa'ala appreciated the feeding of a dog, then what about another human being, whether they are Muslim or not? And what about those hadith in which we learn that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ 
yukrim jara. Fala yu'di jara. Then he should not uh, cause any disturbance or any inconvenience and harm to his neighbor. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let them not harm their neighbor. Did the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam specify it has to be a Muslim neighbor? No, Muslim or non-Muslim alike. So doing good for others, and, and this is why, you know, for example, now you find in, in certain parts uh, where even non-Muslims are, uh, are affected by natural disasters. Do we say to the Muslims, only worry about yourselves and don't worry about the non-Muslims? No, ya akhi. They're human beings. There's something called compassion. Again, if Allah Jalla wa'ala would appreciate that we give a dog water to drink and the dog and you know so many Muslims is najis and you know they say, like you can't even go close to a dog. Ya yeah, subhanallah. If Allah Jalla wa'ala appreciated that, he would not appreciate that you, that you assist a fellow human being. A fellow human being? Of course not. Allah Jalla wa'ala would, uh, would, appreciate, would appreciate that. So these are things that we really need, uh, we really need to keep in mind. And the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are so many. You know about helping others. You think that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would just encourage us to do things and he would not do things on his own? Khabab ibn al-Arad radiallahu anhu arda. There's an incident of him one day when he went out on a campaign. And you see, the, the habit of the Arabs was that it's always men who used to milk the goats and the camels and so forth. It was this part of their habit. Okay? And so, Khabab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu arda goes out on a campaign. Do you know who used to go to his house? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to go to the home of Khabab ibn al-Arat radiallahu anhu arda and he used to milk the goats and the sheep in that household. As a matter of fact, they had several, but only one of them he could milk because others were pregnant and for whatever reason, only the one. And the Prophet ﷺ used to milk that goat or that sheep, whatever it was, and there was more than enough milk, not only for that household, but even for the neighbors. But the bottom line is who used to do this? The Prophet ﷺ himself. And just as a completion of that, uh, of that story, when Khabbab radiallahu anhu came back and he started to milk that, uh, that sheep, he would not give as much milk as when the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam did it. Of course, because of the barakah that Allah jalla wa'ala placed in the hands of uh, the Prophet salawatu rabbi wa salamuhu alayhi. Another incident, again, just to know that, you know, our deen doesn't say, you all have to do this, but the best of this ummah didn't do those things. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was the best of this ummah. He did things himself for others. Look at Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu arda, who was the khalifa. Imagine the khalifa, the head of state, the prime minister, the president, whatever you want to call them today, right? And Umar radiallahu an was so close to him. But yet, he noticed that after Salat al-Fajr, Abu Bakr would run away. Abu Bakr was going somewhere. Nobody knew where he was going. So Umar says to himself, I'm going to follow him. I, of course, he didn't have any doubts about him, but where is he going? Does he just need this me time? He's being alone somewhere on his own? So Umar radiallahu anhu Allah follows him and sees that he goes outside the city limits and he's standing back. Abu Bakr has no idea, radiallahu an, that Umar radiallahu anhu is watching him. He says he goes into this tent and he stays there for some time and then he leaves and I went in after him. So when I went in, I saw an old lady and I asked her, who are you? She said, I'm just a, a weak and fragile old lady who is blind. And you know, she had some, some young girls, some, some young daughters. Huh? And they had uh, some, some livestock inside. And so Umar radiallahu anhu arda says, and who is that guy that was just in here? Who is that man that left just a while ago? Do you think that Abu Bakr, when he went in, he said to her, by the way, you know, I'm the Khalifa. So if anybody asks, don't forget to say that I've done my duty. You know, nothing. She says, I have no idea. Except that this guy, every day, every morning, he comes in and he sweeps our little home for us. And he milks the animals for us. And he, uh, you know, needs the dough for us. He does all of these chores and then he leaves. But I have absolutely no idea who it is. So as we said, it's not that our being tells us that you all have to do this. But the best of you, no, they shouldn't do anything. No, no, lead by example, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, and as Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda uh, did. And 
you know, we have that expression in English about what goes around, comes around. We say in Arabic, al jazaa min jins al-amal. That is, you know, uh, well, you could, you, al jazaa min jins al-amal goes both ways. The punishment fits the crime, but also the reward fits, fits the deed. And so you find, for example, in the, uh, the, the next part of the hadith, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us about uh, you know, the, the mu'sir, the person who is not able to, to pay off their debt. And if you happen to be the one who, who, who loaned them the money, then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, is speaking to you. Or if you happen to be one who knows that person and can do something to alleviate that hardship that they're going through, then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, is speaking to you. So in this part of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Allah will relieve and make easy for you things in the hereafter, in this world as well as the hereafter. Allah will make things easy for you in this world and the hereafter if He make things easy for the one who is in debt and who is unable to pay. We're talking about a person who has every intention of paying, but you know what? They're going through some uh, difficulties. And this is why when we talk about al jazaa min jins al-amal, what goes around comes around. We look to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and what do we learn? We learn that a person, remember we talked about how the sun will be so close and the people will be in, in, in a horrible state because some will be practically drowning in their perspiration. Well, on that day, everybody will be scrambling for a shade. But is there going to be any trees that you can take shade under? Can you take an umbrella? Even if you ask people to bury you with an umbrella, it's not going to help you any. You will have absolutely nothing. It's a, it, it's a flat plain on the day of Qiyamah. The only shade that you and I can possibly have is the shade that Allah Jalla wa'ala provides for us. And therefore, the Prophet wasallam tells us that a person will be in the, or under the shade of their sadaqah of their charity on the day of the day of Qiyamah. So, as we said, what goes around, what goes around, uh, comes around. So then, there are so many ways that we can help one another. Uh, and, and when I say one another, I'm talking about Muslims in general and human beings in general. Feeding those uh, who are poor and needy. Uh, you know, um, relieving them of, of, of whatever distresses they can. And, and if you look to that incident that I mentioned that uh, Ibn Rajab ta'ala mentioned, and then you look to the different hadith, you see that yes, it absolutely makes sense. The Prophet والسلام, even praises that individual who will help another get onto their riding animal. And so in today's context, opening the door for someone. In today's context, lifting somebody's groceries for them. Right? All sorts of things that we can do. Visiting those who are you know, in distress and relieving some of that burden for them. You have absolutely no idea how some people appreciate you going to them because they know that you got, came out of your way and you knocked on their door and you said, Assalamu alaikum to them. And you see, they don't want you to leave because as, for the time that you are there, they are going through some difficulty in their lives. Perhaps one of them is afflicted with... Uh, some sickness or their family is afflicted with a sickness. And guess what? They don't want you to go because as long as you are there, they can forget about their worries. So you are alleviating things for them. And this is, this is something absolutely amazing. And you and I, uh, I'm sure that we've all experienced this, where people don't want you to go. Why? Because they're just so happy to see you there. For a while at least, they can forget about their problems. For a while, they're hearing these kind words from you. Uh, uh, you know, words of consolation and, uh, and, and so forth. So it's very important that we, uh, that we are not selfish and that we think about, uh, that we think about one another. Uh, there is a report, uh, you know, one of the hadith, Sana'iru al-ma'rufi taqi masari' as Basically, that translates to good works protect from evil fates. And, uh, you know, it, it's more or less what I was just speaking about now. When we do all of these, uh, all of these things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from so many, um, from so many other, uh, from so many other uh, calamities. Uh, anyways, there are, there are way too many texts uh, that, that we can share, but I think that uh, these, uh, these are sufficient. And so because of the, um, uh, the, the lack of time, I think what I would like to do is, uh, perhaps just quickly uh, mention a few of the other uh, a few of the other matters that were mentioned in this hadith. We, so we, we discussed the first part, and that is really the part that I wanted to focus on, and this is why we spent pretty much all our time on it. Man nafasa an mu'minin kurbatan 
من كرب الدنيا نفس الله عنه كربة أو عنه كربة من كرب يوم القيامة. Alright, so this one, let us never forget. Not only let us not forget these words, let us not forget to act according to them. Whoever relieves the distress of a believer from the distresses of this world, then Allah will relieve for them one of the distresses from the distresses of the day of judgment. وَمَنْ يَسَّرَ عَلَى مُعْسِرٍ يَسَّرَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ And whoever makes easy for a person who is in difficulty, and we said here, we're specifically speaking about a person who is indebted, then Allah will make uh, things easy for that person in this world and, and, and the next. وَمَنْ سَتَرَ مُسْلِمًا سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ And here again, um, I will suffice with, the, with, with giving the quick meaning, and that is, whoever conceals the faults of another, and particularly he's speaking of another Muslim, then Allah will conceal them in this world as the hereafter, and the hereafter. And this is really important for us to know. And this is why, again, Imam Ibn Rajab alayhi rahmatullah mentions how, you know, some incidents. He said, amongst us, there were those, subhanallah, who used to, uh, who used to speak about others. Although they themselves were not bad. They were not bad people, but they would like to expose the faults of others. Then Allah caused them to do bad things, so people started talking about them. Ya yeah, subhanallah. So let's be really cautious. When I start, you know, spreading bad things about, especially when you know that a person is, is for all intents and purposes, they are a good person, but they are a human being. I mean, they may slip up, they may have committed something wrong, they may have gotten angry and said things that are not becoming of such a person. But as long as you know that person to be a decent person overall, that why would you want to then... You know, and some people, uh, and again, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, and others, they speak about how, or, or Al -Ghaz, even Al-Ghazali, alayhi rahmatullah, they speak about some people who, they appear to be, you know, uh, trying to praise that person. But really, they want to expose them. They say, oh, mashallah, this person is so good, but may Allah forgive him, you know, for his shortcomings. <laughs> What was the need for you to say that? I mean, really, so basically, you want to expose that person, but you want to make, you want to package it in a different way. No, this is not the way. The way is, you know what? If, if his sins are not known by people, there's no need for you to spread them, even if you, you know about them. But our duty is to conceal that, because you know what? What goes around comes around. I start spreading things about you, tomorrow Allah Jalla wa ala will send me someone who will do the same, who will do the same to me. In other words, uh, spread these things about me. In other words, spread my shortcomings and my faults uh, to others. May Allah Jalla wa ala protect us. And the next part of the hadith, Again, every single bit of it is something for us to think about and live by. Wallahu fi awni al abdi, ma dam al abdu fi awni akhihi. Every one of us has to understand that alone we can accomplish nothing. For everything we need Allah to be there for us. We need the assistance of Allah. So here in the hadith found in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam is saying to me and is saying to you. Allah will be with you as long as you are there for others. So helping others is in a sense being selfish also, isn't it? Because if you help others, you're doing yourself a favor. As long as I'm helping you, Allah is going to be there for me. Try it and you will never fail. Be there for others and you will see that how when things start becoming difficult, somehow or other, Allah will make a way out for you. And you will be absolutely shocked and you will be amazed. And alhamdulillah, I know amongst us there are those who have, who have faced that. You know, they, were, they thought they were going to die. And Allah Jalla wa'ala sent them somebody who, subhanAllah, out of the blue, they just came about. And perhaps it's because of one little thing you did at some point in your life. And because there was ikhlas in it, Allah Jalla wa'ala, Allah Jalla wa'ala assisted you in that time of need of yours. Uh, the next part of the hadith, وَمَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ بِهِ عِلْمًا سَهَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ And we hope, insha'Allah ta'ala, that gatherings such as this will earn us this reward. Whoever takes that path or treads that path in which, and, and their intention therein is to attain knowledge. يَلْتَمِسُ بِهِ عِلْمًا It doesn't necessarily mean that you are sitting in an Islamic university and you sit at the... No. You find an opportunity to go and learn something about your deen. If you go, as long as you are on that path, Allah Jalla wa'ala will make the path to Jannah easy for you. May we be included amongst those people, inshaAllah ta'ala. 
This part of the hadith talks about people who gather in one of the houses of Allah in a masjid. For what purpose? They're reading the Qur'an. They're, they are studying the Qur'an, doing something similar to what we are doing. What are we doing? We are talking about what Allah says. This is why we mentioned ayat of the Qur'an. What happens? What is the reward for such people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down a sakina or tranquility upon them. The mercy, the rahmah of Allah Jalla wa ala descends upon them. The angels surround such a gathering. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions these people to the angels that are, that are in his neighborhood. Do we earn that reward here? This is not a masjid. But I say, inshaAllah ta'ala, we will earn that reward. Because Allah knows, if a masjid was available to us, we would not be sitting here, we would be sitting in the masjid. So, Allah Jalla wa ala is... Ar-Rahman and he is Ar-Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in our hearts. We don't have a masjid to go to. We are not permitted. It's okay. We still do what we have to do. Allah jalla wa ala, inshaAllah, now, rest assured, inshaAllah, the rahmah of Allah is descending upon us. That tranquility from Allah jalla wa ala is surrounding us. The, the malaika are around us. Bi-idnihi subhanahu wa ta'ala because he tabarak wa ta'ala knows what our intention is. And let's hope that we will always, it doesn't matter where we can learn some Islamic knowledge, we go. We go. Why? Because we want these rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we want that Allah jalla wa ala praises us before His malaika or His angels. And the last part of the hadith, remember that it doesn't matter who you are related to. It doesn't matter what family you belong to. It doesn't matter how righteous or pious my parents or my relatives may be. If my deeds are not in order, then my lineage will not help me. My lineage will not help me. And subhanAllah, when I, uh, when I see this part of the hadith, وَمَنْ بَطَّأَ بِهِ عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ When I look at this part of the hadith, you know, I think back, and I don't know if it's only a cultural thing that, that happened to be, you know, when, when I was growing up, or some of you also... Uh, when, when some of you or some of you also have experienced it but I still remember when I was a little kid because some of my uncles happened to be uh, happened to be students of knowledge they alhamdulillah they studied uh, they studied the deen and so on and so forth and so some of my aunts you know who weren't necessarily doing the right thing all the time they would say to their brother don't worry I'm right behind you that is in the akhirah I'll hang on to your shirt so you can take me to Jannah with you. I don't know if any of you have heard anything like that. But piggyback. Huh? Piggyback. Piggyback. Piggyback, Aww. right? So, I mean, I still, I still remember vividly some of my aunts saying to my uncles that don't worry, we're behind you, we'll hang on to you so we, we, we'll go into Jannah along with you. In other words, I'm, you know, I don't have to do anything. I, I belong to this family. That sort of thing. All right? But of course, the Prophet ﷺ is telling you and he's telling me that we are responsible for ourselves. So my family's piety and righteousness is not sufficient for me. It has to be that I do something with my own hands. It is that we have to do those deeds on, on our own. And with this, inshaAllah ta'ala, we conclude. And I cannot stress enough that these ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ are not for our entertainment, but rather they are for us to ponder and then to act upon aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullaha li wa lakum wa li sa'ir muslimin wa fastaghfiruh innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim I apologize that we, uh, we went on fairly long. Uh, is there any, are there any comments or any questions before we leave? So the issue of, you know, if calamity strikes, then 
what should be the um, you know what should be the reaction of the believer? So of course one of them is, and and, and the most important thing is, for us to accept what has happened as being from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being patient in the face of it, and also being pleased. When we say pleased, not, not necessarily happy, but being pleased, meaning that being content with what has taken place. Right? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, did he face calamities in his life? Of course. But he never complained about what happened. His complaint was always lodged with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He complained to Allah about his condition so that Allah could grant him relief. But never complained about Allah. But as you said, some people will question, why would Allah do this to me? This is complaining about Allah. This is complaining about Allah. But rather the believer immediately understands that whatever happens, it is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, one of the salaf, uh, his name again escapes me, I, I perhaps will remember it. Uh, one of the salaf, he used to leave the people in salah. Okay? And when he would go forward, he would look behind him to see whether or not his son was there. Uh, his name is on the tip of my tongue. And Al-Fudayr ibn Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala, zakallah khairan. So Al-Fudayr rahimahullah ta'ala used to check to see if his son was behind him or not. Why? Because his son would be very moved by the ayat of the Qur'an and particularly if those ayat were speaking about the punishment of the hereafter, then he would perhaps faint in his salah. So he would check. If his son was there, he'd re recite the ayat speaking about Jannah and the rewards and so on and so forth. And if his son wasn't there, he would take the opportunity to, re to recite those ayat. We speak about punishment because they are also moving and, and, and they will open up people's hearts and, and, and eyes. So that one day he goes, he doesn't see his son and he begins reciting and he recites those ayat in which there are, there's mention of the hellfire and punishment. After he started, his son came. And when he was reciting those ayat, his son fainted. And after the salah, when they went to him, they found that he had died. They found that he had died. Alayhi rahmatullah. And when they looked to Al-Fudayl, rahimahullah ta'ala, because now, you know, they, they, they prepared the body and they, they, they prayed over him and they're going to bury him. And they saw a smile on, 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 on the face of Al-Fudayl, rahimahullah ta'ala. And they asked him about that. Like, are you kidding me? Your son just died. We're about to bury your son. And here you are smiling as though you are happy about it. And you know his response was that he didn't want to show. He didn't want to show even physically that he was displeased with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written for him. And when the ulama commented on this, they said, but you see, he was not able to keep the same balance as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do you think that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam did not feel sad when he lost somebody close to him? Ibrahim, his own his own son. What happened when, when, he was in his, when he was in his hands? Or even, for, uh, for that matter, his grandson. When he passed away and he was in his hands. The Prophet wasallam shed tears. And they were like, Are you, you, you shed tears over it? He says, yes. We become saddened. But at the same time, we never say anything that would be displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when calamity strikes, and it will. Nobody is saying that you can't be sad. It's natural. People will feel that sadness. Nobody is saying you cannot shed tears. But everything within reason and within limits. It happened. And this is why our reaction, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Inna lillahi ma akhad. Walahu ma a'ta. Wa kullu shay'in indahu li ajalin musamma. We remind ourselves of these things. We belong to Allah. And we will return to Allah. Right? To Allah belongs everything that He takes. To Allah belongs everything that He has given. And everything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has an appointed term. So if you and I remember these things, inshallah, when calamity does strike, and it will, I mean, we, we don't like it necessarily, but when it does, we are not saying that you should be happy and have a party. Oh, you know, my house got burned down. You know, I mean, no, nobody is saying anything of that nature. But subhanallah, this was the will of Allah jalla wa ala. And there must be a, a wisdom behind it. Know and rest assured 
that whatever happens, however it seems, it is good for you. However difficult it may seem. How do we know that? عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ إِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ وَلَيْسَ ذَاكَ إِلَّا وَلَيْسَ ذَاكَ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ So the Prophet ﷺ says that really the affair of the believer is incredible. It is amazing. Why? Because every single thing that happens to the believer is good. And that is specific to the believer. How come? He explains it then. In أَصَابَتْ هُسَرَّا شَكَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرَ اللَّهِ Something good comes to that individual. Shaka, they're, they're grateful to Allah Jalla wa'ala and so it's better for them. And how can it not be better for you when Allah Jalla wa'ala says, وَلَا إِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ That if you show gratitude, Allah will give you even more. And then he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَإِن أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّا صَبَرْ فَكَانَ فَكَانَ خَيْرَ اللَّهِ And if some calamity strikes that individual, then they practice self-restraint. When we talk about uh, patience, it, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't give justice to that word, sabr. Self-restraint. In other words, you control yourself. And I think this is, where you're, this is what you're aiming at. We control ourselves. And we don't question why Allah did. No, we accept it. Uh, yeah. I, I totally accept and I'm pleased with Allah as my Lord. Meaning, I know that He only causes things to happen because ultimately there is good in it for me. إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Allah Jalla wa'ala tells us that the only, uh, it is only those who practice this self-restraint who will have their reward without measure with Allah Jalla wa'ala. Without measure with Allah. Which is something beyond... beyond. So, we have some people who, and, and, and the words that you use are, are, are very accurate, meaning that they blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say, Allah told me to pray, I'm praying. Allah said to pay zakah, I pay zakah. Allah told me to fast, I fast. I'm doing all of these wonderful things and I'm helping people and yet, all of these calamities befall me. Or, look at me, I'm not succeeding, I'm not moving ahead in this world. Why is Allah doing this to me when I'm doing everything? Well, uh, is this allowed? Is it a sin for doing that? And we say that yes, it is a sin. Because how can we blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what seems to be going wrong in, uh, in our lives? The reality is that when, you know, when we do things, then we should understand we do them, yes, because they're the right thing to do according to what Allah Jalla uh, wa has commanded us and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we have to understand that the reward for that or the compensation for that is also in the hands of Allah Jalla wa So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will compensate us according to what He knows is best for us. So the, why is it haram then for us to blame Allah? It is haram because it is as though we are saying that listen, what I deserve for what I did, Allah is not giving me. Which means that He has been un, uh, unjust. There's some injustice from Allah Jalla wa'ala towards me. This is, yani, um, uh, th th this is what we are saying through our actions, if you will. You know, without us openly saying, that, oh look, Allah is, is being unjust towards me. But through our actions, this is what we, this is what we, are, we are showing. Why does that happen? It happens because, Wallahu a'lam, it happens partially because, you see the things that we discussed today, we talked about why things happen to us. If you don't understand, then of course you're going to jump to that conclusion that, oh, I deserve this, but Allah is not giving it to me. But if I understand and you understand, ah, hang on a second, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be uh, withholding these things from me because He wants to test my patience and elevate my status it may be that Allah uh, well I'm not I'm not the second category that we mentioned which is that you know we turn away from Allah no 
But perhaps I have done some wrongs, and so Allah Jalla wa'ala wants to purify me. And so He is, uh, he is wiping away my sins through these uh, difficulties and calamities that He puts, uh, that he puts in, uh, in, in my way. The other thing is, you know, some people may say things like that or other people will jump to the conclusion that Allah does not love them. Allah hates me, you see, because He's not... If that was the case, what about the prophets? Do we know of anybody who went through more uh, difficulties and had more calamities come their way than the prophets? We don't know any of them. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the way that some people look at things. The cup is half full or it's half empty. No, no, the, the mu'min is, 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 is the one who is optimistic at all times. If Allah doesn't give it to you, it's because He knows that good lies in it for you. So as long as we keep our hearts attached to Allah, knowing that He knows better than we know always, Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamu. Then inshaAllah ta'ala our, uh, our problems will be, will be solved. So in short again, yes it is a sin because it is as though we are accusing Allah of injustice. But rather we need to Look beyond it. Wa asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. This one of the pillars of faith. Al qadar wal qadar. Naam. 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 Wa antu mina billahi. Wa antu mina bil qadari khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allahi ta'ala. Naam. Jazakumullah khayran. And we'll see you guys the next time. Allah hafiz. Allah hafiz.